So the story goes like this. An elderly lady was driving this big, shiny, new, expensive car. She's getting ready to back into a parallel parking spot, and suddenly this young man in a small sports car quickly moves in front of her and noses right into the parking spot. The woman is furious. She demands to know why he did that. And, you know, what he's, she, she, she was right there. He knew that she was trying to pull into the space. And he says, because I'm young and I'm quick. And he pops his remote and he heads into the store. Now, while he's inside, the car that was in the parking space in front of that pulls out. The elderly lady pulled into that vacant space that's just ahead of this guy's little car. And when he comes out of the store a few minutes later, he finds this elderly lady using her big, shiny new car as a battering ram. Uh, she's wiggling it in, moving it back and forth, just like forward a little bit and slamming back into his bumper. Like, he, he's on fire. He demands, like, why are you wrecking my car? And she said, because you may be young and quick, but I'm old and I'm rich. Revenge can be sweet. A little punk deserved it, right? Except what he did was not a crime, and what she did was. Speaking of crimes, this is a thing that actually happened in, in Ontario a few years ago. A police officer pulled a man over on the highway for speeding. And the officer tried to keep things professional, keep things civil, uh, but the guy was rude. He was extremely rude and he insulted her with words that I can't repeat here, and implied that, or at least maybe even outright said, the only reason that she pulled him over was because of her gender and insecurity and possibly time of month. And, whew, of course he got a ticket for the full amount of his uh, speeding uh, offense, and she wished him a nice day. But he could not resist getting in one last dig. She got back into her car, and he pulled out ahead onto the road. And as he did, he put his left arm out of the window and raised a finger. It was not that finger. Uh, well, she immediately pulled him back over and wrote him a ticket. What about freedom of expression, you might ask? You know, freedom of speech. Well, she did not write him a ticket for giving her the finger. She wrote him an $85 ticket for using an improper arm signal for a lane change. Because, of course, pulling out to the left, his arm should be extended straight. Isn't that funny? Did he get what he deserved? Or is that an abuse of police authority? He was a jerk, but she arguably laid false charges because he challenged her and she didn't like it. How we react to that tends to depend on who we see as having the power, who we identify with. You see, we like to see this, this plucky hero overcome the evil empire. That's wired into us. And we can see the same situation in different ways. Like, on the one side, we see this person of privilege, uh, a man of means versus a person who has struggled against her minority status for her whole life and probably is once again having that status thrown in her face. It's a case of a woman getting one back on a misogynistic jerk. But on the other side, we see an officer of the law with the weight of the criminal justice system behind her versus an ordinary driver who is being subjected to her petty whims. It's a case of a citizen being oppressed by a corrupt police officer. In general, he has the greater power, but in this specific case, the power was all in her hands. Let's put that aside and let it sit for just a while. This is the time in our service that we take a trip back in that way back machine to join a whole crowd of people as they listen to a Jewish rabbi named Yeshua. The Greek version of his name was Jesus. Jesus would have spoken a couple of different languages. He would have spoken Aramaic. As a Jewish man, he would have learned that. It was the language of his Hebrew people. It was the language of, uh, you know, the synagogue and his home. It was the, the common language of the Middle Eastern people. 
It was the language he would have read scripture from. He would have prayed in. It would have been the language that he joked in around the dinner table. But Jesus also would have spoken Greek. And Greek was the language of the conquerors. Latin may have been the official legal language of the Roman Empire, but ever since Alexander the Great had conquered the known world, Greek was what everybody spoke. It was the language of merchants, it was the language of philosophers. Latin actually would have been pretty new to the region, because it would have only been about you know, 60 years before Jesus was born, since the Romans had taken that region away from the Greeks. What I'm saying is if you wanted to get by in first century Palestine, whatever your home language was, you knew Greek. It was all around you, and Greek, if it wasn't your home language, it was a constant reminder that you were ruled by a foreign power. Jesus was born into an occupied nation. Israelites had not ruled themselves for centuries. Any sense of self-government that they had managed to attain was a limited freedom that was underneath the authority of whatever governor or ruler had been assigned above them. The, the other power gave them whatever right they had. It wasn't theirs inherently. Uh, they were second-class citizens in their own homeland. They paid taxes to Rome, and their taxes paid the wages of the soldiers that kept them in line. And I would imagine that turning to a Roman soldier and saying, hey, my taxes pay your salary, probably would work as well as, you know, saying the same thing to a police officer at the side of the road. They had to have permission from the governor to practice their own religion. In fact, the office of Jewish high priest was appointed by the Romans. The Romans were powerful. The Romans were wealthy. Is it any wonder that the Roman morals and Roman virtues and Roman ideals, they filled the minds of the Jewish people? Is it any wonder that a people who lived in the shadow of this, this power would measure their status by the power that they had over others? You know, it must have been a real kick in the teeth for the Pharisees and other wealthy Jewish people, people who had great status in their own home communities, to have to bow and scrape to people with that much more authority than them. Even so, they knew, these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, these, these official, officious leaders of the Jews, they knew that the way to get as far ahead as possible was to copy and cozy up to Rome. Of course, there were some who would not put up with it. They were called zealots. They were like Jewish rebels. They were guerrilla fighters that stood up to the Roman authority. These zealots, they were sure that the Jewish Messiah was coming soon because the Messiah would lead them in driving back the Roman invaders. They, they would give them back their land. The Messiah would usher in this lasting era of military and political dominance for the nation of Israel. Part of the problem that Jesus had was that he didn't fall in line with either of these ends of the spectrum. Both of these groups, they wanted to win. First one wanted to win by being like the conquerors. The second, by conquering the conquerors. Both of these groups had an end result in mind that looked like the best thing that they could picture for themselves. God didn't really factor into their vision except as a way of getting them what they wanted. It's these kinds of people that Jesus was surrounded by as he preached the Sermon on the Mount. This is the stage he stood on. This is the environment that he lived in, the state of mind that he spoke into. They knew all the right words, but it was like the, the glasses that they had to read them were, were you know, the wrong prescription, or they were dyslexic or something. Like The perspective that God's people had of God had become so warped, so messed up, that it was barely recognizable. I'm sure that it had been a long, long time before, like, since they'd seen themselves as any kind of salt and light people, people who were on a mission from God. Their view of themselves, their, their capabilities, it had gotten smaller and smaller and smaller as they came to see themselves, not as God saw them, but as the Assyrians saw them, and then the Babylonians, and then the Greeks, and now the Romans. And when they thought of winning, they thought of 
the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans, they thought of dominance. It's not just human nature, it was their nurture, it was their environment. They were culturally almost as far removed from God's original intent as we are from them. And that's why Jesus is recalibrating them here. There's this sense that, that people sometimes have that there's the law and then there's Jesus. You know, law, Jesus. And, and that Jesus is somehow against the law. Jesus is changing the law. Jesus is rewriting the law. He's not. He's not doing that. He's restoring the law. Although to the people that had grown up in that environment, secure and comfortable in their understanding of the law, it must have seemed radical, heretical even. Jesus was turning things upside down from their perspective, even if from his, he was setting it right side up. He wanted them to be fighting not for their own kingdom on earth, but for the kingdom of heaven. He didn't want them to beat the world. He wanted them to help him save it. That's way harder. It meant that they couldn't use their relationship with God as some sort of escape tunnel, where if they said and did the right things, God would like sneak them out. It meant that they couldn't use following the law as a way to compel God to give them what they wanted, to force him to do it because they had done this right thing. It means that they could not score their righteousness against someone else's to show how much better they were as people. Jesus went through a whole lot of uh, they says, quoting the law that they'd been taught and that they were teaching and saying that the kingdom of heaven righteousness, kingdom of heaven righteousness doesn't stop there. Kingdom of heaven righteousness lives on a God trajectory. Right? Uh, kingdom of heaven righteousness isn't being better than other people's righteousness. Kingdom of heaven righteousness is being like God's righteousness. So anger, lust, divorce, honesty, they said, he said. This week we're carrying on to what had become known as the law of the tooth. We're in Matthew chapter 5 today, starting at verse 38, running to verse 42. As Jesus says to that increasingly uncomfortable crowd, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away the one who wants to borrow from you. Like I said, the law of the tooth. We find the passage that Jesus is quoting in Leviticus uh, with some repetition in Deuteronomy. This is a law that was given to the Jewish people something like 1,300 years before Jewish Jesus came. And it's uh, found wrapped up with a bunch of other legal proceedings in Leviticus. It's in Leviticus chapter 24, verses 19, sorry, 19 to 22. I'm going to throw it up on the screen here. Leviticus 24, 19 to 22. Anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. Whoever kills an animal must make restitution, but whoever kills a human being is to be put to death. You are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. I am the Lord your God. Sounds harsh, right? You know, proportional response, quid pro quo. It is a deterrent. They get exactly what they deserve. It's kind of weird, that last line that's, that's in there, though. You have to have the same law for the foreigner and the native-born. Well, that's to make sure that as the nation of Israel is dominant as it is when they're getting this, right? as they are the power, they're the ones in charge, they are the hostile, invading, <laughs> conquering power in this area. They're enforcing their will by sword and might, the punishments for the people that they have conquered are equally merciful. I said merciful because the law of the tooth was not the standard that was upheld in the regions that they were conquering, the regions that were around them. It wasn't the standard that the people they conquered held. They lived by the law of the sword. 
the disproportional response. The law of the sword said that infractions were to be met with retribution above and beyond the infraction. Insult repaid with violence. Injury repaid with blood. There's this weird little aside thrown into the book of Genesis near the beginning. It's the story of Cain. Uh, the story of Cain and Abel, it, it covers the first murder. Cain got jealous. And Abel, he uh, beats him to death with a rock, so God killed him right back, right? No. The story goes that God exiled him. But not only that, God put a mark on Cain to make sure that anyone who did try to kill him right back would be punished. Lamech was one of Cain's descendants. We don't know much about him, but uh, he's listed in the genealogy. As he's listed in this genealogy, he says this. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Let me translate that for you. A guy injured me, so I killed him. Cain killed someone for no reason, and God protected him, so God is totally cool with me killing someone who gave me cause to do it. God says, no, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, injury for injury. You cannot kill someone for injuring you. So that's righteous, right? As angry as you are, you want to go above and beyond, but you hold back and you just only get even. Well, as we've seen the past few weeks, that's really kind of the bare minimum. Like the world was here, and God sets the post here, right? That's not where God is. Maybe it would have been better to say the world is here, God sets the post here, but God's still over here somewhere. God gave the law to set direction, not destination. If that was it, if that was the righteousness of God, we would be in a lot of trouble. Like, that would be really bad news, guys. It would mean that we get exactly what we deserve. It would mean that we get exactly the penalty for every infraction of God's law that we've got coming. That's not what happened, is it? And John 3, 17 says that God the Father did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The nature of God is to love the one who offends him and to give himself up to save him. Another piece of this is that this eye for an eye judgment was supposed to be made by the courts. It was limiting the punishment of the crime. It was never permission for an injured party to to go out and get his own back, even if that is what had become over time. That a righteous person gives a proportional response to the person who wronged them. But what did Jesus say? And we're going to bring this back up. Understanding they were living as a conquered people and trying to apply a law that God had given them when they were the conquerors. So we're back at Matthew 5. We're going to chop a verse off each end here. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. So culturally, to be slapped on the right cheek, one of two things would have had to happen. Would have had to be an open-handed slap, which was, you know, it was the mark of an equal. And people would not have done that, or it had to be a backhanded slap. And would have had to be done with the right hand, because the left hand was dirty. Right? So it was an act of dominance. It was slap. His open-handed would have been left, not done. Slap. To offer the other cheek would have meant they either had to hit as an equal or use the hand that was not used. It's a response to an act of dominance. It says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt... Hand over to your coat as well. The, the words used in this uh, are a little more culturally specific. Uh, if you were suing, imagine suing someone to take their shirt. Okay? If they don't have anything left, that's all they've got. 
you've got the shirt on your back and you're taking the work for the shirt on your back. What kind of person does that? But there was rules. There was rules and regulations that said, if you take that, you cannot take the cloak. You can take this, the tunic, but you can't take the cloak because the cloak was also their covering for overnight. When it got cold, it, was, it had utility. You take the shirt, but you couldn't take the coat. And Jesus says, if, you're, if they're going to be this petty, if they're going to come in, just, you know what? Give them the cloak as well. Show them exactly how ridiculous and petty they're being. If anyone forces you to go one mile, it, it, this was an act of dominance. The only other instance of this word that, that, that is translated forces is in Matthew 27, 32. It's this. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. You see, Roman soldiers had the authority to compel, to force any non-citizen to carry their baggage, but not for more than a mile. And Jesus says, if they're going to take advantage and do this act of dominance, just keep going. Show them something different. So what do you do in the face of injustice? What do you do in the face of oppression? You know, don't you stand up to it? Don't you fight against it? Isn't that righteous? If you let people get away with it, it's never going to get better, right? So why is Jesus saying to be a doormat? He's not. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't say if somebody strikes you on the right cheek, you know, bow and cringe. He doesn't say if somebody sues you for your shirt, hide behind the law that says he can't take your cloak at least. He doesn't say if someone forces you to go one mile, then, you know, go that whole mile, every single step, and keep your mouth shut. A famous civil rights leader said that there are three responses to oppression. First, there's acquiescence. There's giving up. You resign yourself to your doom. You just do the best you can for yourself within their system. That was the response of the Pharisees. The second response is violence. You physically fight back. You meet violence with violence. You meet hatred with hatred. And, you know, at least in equal measure. But really, if you want to win, you need to respond with such fire and force that they are terrified to carry on doing what they're doing. Incidentally, that is also called terrorism. And it rarely works as the terrorists hope. And that was the response of the zealots. There's a third response. The third response is active, nonviolent resistance. It's a resistance that says, this is not okay, but it returns hate with love. And it's infinitely harder. The only response, though, that has ever transformed enemies into allies. Remember, God's purpose for his people is not for them to dominate, it's for them to deliver. They don't win by sending their enemies to hell, they win by increasing the population of heaven. And sure, you can fight back. It, it, it seems right, it feels right, but in winning the battle, we lose the war. You don't find Gandhi in the Bible, uh, but in the case of all truth is God's truth, he was right in saying that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. It's the Hatfields and the McCoys. It's the Jews and the Romans. Pushing back just makes the other person push harder. You see, the Jews did rise up eventually. They armed themselves. They stood in militant response against the Romans. They pushed the legions out of Judea. But when the Roman Empire retaliated, the abomination of desolation stood in the heart of the temple, and the temple was torn down before their eyes. For almost 2,000 years, since AD 66, the Jewish people have not been able to offer a proper biblical sacrifice for sin in accordance with the Old Testament law. The early Christians, who were persecuted to a degree that was far greater than the Jewish people had ever faced, they responded differently. They responded with unexpected love and grace, and it was confusing for the Romans, and it was challenging, and it was not fast. Jesus resisted. The apostles resisted. The early Christians resisted. So this one, he says, do not resist the evildoer. You know, he's not saying do nothing. He's talking about how to resist. The Greek word that uh, is used here for resist means to set yourself Opposed to, 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 
to plant and block this active opposition. It's pushing back in the opposite direction, but you cannot push someone into the, the kingdom of heaven. Well, I gave you a heads up that I was going to call you up and ask you for some help during this. Uh, I'd like you to, to come up now. Uh, Wally is gonna gonna help me out to to, to sh show you something. So okay, like, just stand right here for a second. Say hi to the internet, Wally. Hi. All right. So <laughs> I want to be over there, okay. but you want me to be over there, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So put our hands together. We start pushing. Okay, we're not gonna push super hard because I know you're way stronger than me. <laughs> but uh, you know, we push against each other. We push. We push. We push. I push harder, he pushes harder, we wind up yeah, still in the same place. But if I get out of your way, keep going, go. Come on, that's way. <laughs> Come back here. We're going to pretend that uh, that works. Yeah. All right? So we're pushing. I'm pushing as hard as I can. And he's pushing as hard as I can, and I led him to the side. Yeah. Thank you. That, that was good. That's exactly <laughs> what I wanted. Well done on take two. He gets out of my way. I'm free to continue the destination. I don't know whether I'll edit that or not. But, how would history look if the early Christians had instead of stepping aside and letting them trip over themselves, showing the difference between here and there, showing a difference between response? How would it look if the early Christians had taken up arms against the Roman Empire? How would that look today, 2,000 years later? Using someone's momentum against them, that's the, the foundation of most of the, the classic martial arts. It's, it's, it's about not force on force, but directing and letting the person's own actions wind up in a place that they don't expect. And as a Christian, as a salt and light, my fight isn't against the person harming me anyway. My fight is against the kingdom that they represent. And, and the way to win against that kingdom isn't just to beat that fighter, since we're in this analogy, but it's to win over the crowd. It's to win over the ones who are witnessing the fight. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the ultimate weakness of violence is that it's a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie or establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate, and so it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Or... As the Apostle Paul put it, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to revenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So when Jesus finishes his thought by saying, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you, that seems like it's all of a sudden this weird tangent. What he's saying is that when you have an opportunity to get one back, right, the Jewish people, even when they were oppressed, they could still become very wealthy, and they often did so through money lending. When all of a sudden you have your enemy at your mercy and he needs something for you, show him mercy. Don't take the chance to score one for the home team, Jesus says. Be different. Remember that if someone else seems to hold the power, when we try to take it back, that is us accepting that the power is theirs. We give evil the power. When instead we turn to God and, and, and we say that the power isn't ours, but it's not theirs either. The ultimate power belongs to God. That is a victory. And I'm sure that everyone here, I'm sure that everyone here can picture someone in their mind who 
has wronged them. Someone who deserves revenge. But what if instead of seeing these acts of injustice as attacks, you see them as setups? You see them as, you know, at the risk of a sporting metaphor, the, the alley oop or something, the, the, the set. You see them as opportunities to score a point for the kingdom of heaven instead of yourself by actively loving your enemy, even if it does cost you in the short run. What if? Don't play the world's game. Don't play the world's game because you cannot win that way. The kingdom of heaven does not win that way. Be like Jesus. Jesus has given us his example. Jesus has shown us how the kingdom of heaven wins. And history has borne that out so far. Jesus speaks it here. Jesus shows us on the cross. Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him. So this week, as you're dealing with these people, these people that you know, I know you know them, they're in your mind right now. Pray for them. Respond in a way that is not expected. And don't expect it to immediately change anything. But know that in handing God the power instead of them, you are making inroads, you are scoring points, you are winning a victory for the kingdom of heaven.